Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church in Lawrence, South Carolina. And I come out down here this evening with a few friends of mine for the express purpose of preaching the gospel of grace to you. That is, exalting the Lord Jesus Christ. We come here to, to preach concerning what He has done, that He died on the cross as a sacrifice for sin, and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. We're out here to warn about the wrath of God which is to come, to tell why Christ had to come, that, that God is a holy God and we have, we have fallen short of the glory of God. And thereby we have condemned ourselves by our sin and we are in desperate need of a Savior. And there is no Savior suitable for us other than the Lord Jesus Christ. For no other man could do what He could do and did what He did and said what He said and fulfilled what He said. And even now at this very moment, being the King of glory as He is, He reigns and rules as the the Lord of creation as the sovereign ruler of the universe. And all things are under His sovereign dominion and control. And we know ultimately He is working all things to the end that He might be glorified and that He might be honored in them. And so out here tonight we desire that God would be glorified as the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is preached. And the text of Scripture that I would like to direct your attention to on this Friday night is out of the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 2. And we're going to look at verses 7 and 8 of Romans chapter 2. But I will read verse 6 to give us a little bit of context because verse 7 actually breaks a sentence. And so Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. In, in verse 6 of chapter 2 of Romans, he writes, Who, and he's speaking here of God, who will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation. And this, those two verses there, verses 7 and 8, speak to God's justice, the outer working of this divine attribute that God possesses, that in God's perfect justice and in His righteousness and in His holiness, God deals with people according to what they have done. He brings upon them what their deeds have earned for them. And He is just in doing that. In fact, the psalmist declares in Psalm 119, 137, he writes, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. There is not one of God's judgments that is in any way flawed, but in all of God's dealings with the children of men, He is utterly to the uttermost, completely perfect. And that works out to rendering to each man according to what he has done, and to each woman according to what she has done, and to each child according to what they have done. Whether one is old or young, rich or pure, or poor, I should say, excuse me, black or white, God deals with people justly according to justice and righteousness. But that is not a cause of rejoicing for the wicked. For that is actually a cause of fear for the wicked. God's righteousness and His holiness, though it is something that the righteous delight in, and something that Christians have joy in knowing that God possesses, for the wicked it causes them fear because God is holy and He brings upon the wicked justice for their sin. If anyone who thinks... If there is anyone who thinks that God does not do this, such a person has rejected Scripture, has rejected the testimony of the Word of God. 
For Proverbs 16, verse 4 reads, The Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. That is something, that is a truth which is very hard to swallow and to accept, but it nonetheless is true. That God punishes the wicked. Many people have no problem accepting that God is love, and Scripture testifies to that reality. But so few truly say that they agree with the scriptural testimony concerning God's holiness, God's righteousness, and God's justice, and how those things work in relation to the sinner or in relation to the righteous. For the Scripture says, those who are righteous will be rewarded for their righteousness and according to their righteousness. But as we will see later on, there is none righteous, there is no one who does righteousness. And so therefore we are all are on this equal plane of condemnation without hope apart from the saving grace of God as it is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it ultimately is that grace that I seek to make known this evening. The saving grace of God. The special saving grace that has been revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that is what we're going to see this evening as we look at this text and others together. But before we dig into this specific passage here in Romans 2, I want us to consider for a moment the context here in Romans. What is Paul getting to? What is Paul, where is he at in his argumentation here in this book? Well, in chapter 1, he established his thesis statement that it, the gospel is what the whole book of Romans is going to be about, the good news of Jesus Christ. But for one to understand that the bad news must be comprehended. One must grasp their sin and their helpless state before God before they can see how God has graciously has graciously furnished the ark of salvation in the sight of all people. Simply put, one must see the bad news before they can accept the good. One must understand their lost state before they can be found by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he begins in chapter 1 in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And so that's bad news. That's pretty depressing. That, that would make anyone downcast because it's a sad reality, but it's nonetheless a reality that God's wrath from heaven is revealed upon the is revealed from heaven toward the wicked. However, this is not just for those who are outwardly pagans and are unchurched people and are people who do not claim to be religious. No, the bad news is even for the religious. And that is why in chapter 2 of Romans, Paul points the finger to the religious and says, in effect, it does not matter how good you think yourself to be or how hard you try and to earn righteousness before God. You cannot save yourself by your work. You cannot save yourself by your good deeds. It is only by grace, through faith, and the finished work of Jesus Christ that a man is justified. It is not by religious performance. And that's why in chapter 2, verse 1, he says this, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. But do you suppose this, O oh man, when you pass judgment on those who practice such things, and do the same yourself that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you think lightly of the riches of His kindness and tolerance and patience? No, no. God bless you, sir. Thank you. Not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance. And so he points the finger at the religious, at the proud religious people and says, you can't save yourself. 
And then he goes on the next few verses as we're going to see and establishes a doctrine here concerning the justice of God and reminding the religious that God deals according to people. Or deals with people, I should say, according to what they have done, whether good or bad. And that's what I want us to consider this evening, is God's dealing with people on the basis of their deeds. And so we find ourselves, as I just read in verse 6, when he says, who will render to each person according to his deeds. And then verse 7 and 8 is what we're focusing on. He says in verse 7, to those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. Notice what he says there at the beginning. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality. It is that, here is the thing with us, friends, we may do good for a season, we may perform rightly, but it is only for a season, it is only for a short-lived period of time. And then we find ourselves having sinned and having fallen short of the glory of God once more. We cannot keep ourselves in a state of holiness. There may be for a few moments we find ourselves with pure motives before God and pure intentions and pure performance even. But we quickly find that our perseverance in such holiness is greatly, woefully imperfect. And so because we are imperfect, we fall dreadfully short of a perfect God. That's why it says to those who by perseverance in doing good. And then listen to what it says. It see, they seek for glory, honor, and immortality. They live for the life which is to come. And this is really the opposite of how people live these days. People are engrossing themselves in the lust and the pleasures and the cares of this life and not taking into consideration eternity where they're going to stand before God on the day of judgment whether they are going to spend eternity in the presence of God and of the holy angels are they going to spend eternity in glory or are they going to spend eternity in the place of punishment for the wicked that place called hell people so often do not take into consideration these things but instead live for only this life they live for this temporal life we could say they're living after the flesh. They're, they're following after the flesh and not caring about spiritual things. Such people are greatly to be pitied. But this is not just for a certain type of person, but this is all people. We all have this inherent within us. This sinfulness, this hostility toward God, this enmity toward our Creator. Because of the sin of our father Adam, we have inherited this sinful nature. In fact, the psalmist wrote in Psalm 51, David said, In sin did my mother conceive me. Sin is not something that we learn, but it is something that is brought to us, and we find it even at our conception. And notice what it says at the end of verse 7. Two simple words, eternal life. Friends, if you want to go to heaven, here's what you got to do. You got to be perfect. You've got to be absolutely perfect and obedient to God in everything. And that's our dilemma. That's that's the issue. Is we're not. We're imperfect. We're sinners, and we're far. We're even much further from being just imperfect. But we're haters of God, as chapter one of Romans says. It says in verse thirty of the wicked that they are slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So truly, it's a hopeless state that the wicked are in. But nonetheless, the text reads that God will reward those who are perfect. God will reward those who perfectly keep His law and live in absolute conformity to His commands. But therein is the problem. It is because we cannot do that. And so really... 
no one fits into this category that is made before us, laid bare before us in verse 7. But listen to what it says in verse 8. But to those who are selfishly ambitious, many people, as I said earlier, live for this life and live only for the temporal passions of the flesh and not for eternity. And it is also true that people do not live for the glory of God as they ought to. Friends, God is working all things to that chief end. It is for His glory. In fact, in the Baptist Catechism, the second question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to that question is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. That is the chief end of the creation of man, is to bring God the glory, is to glorify Him. And so when we are not living for the glory of God, we have rejected by our actions God's ultimate purpose for us and for all of mankind and ultimately all things. And so a mark of the perverse and ungodly is that they are selfishly ambitious. They live for themselves. And then it says, and do not obey the truth. They do not obey the truth. That would be the gospel. They do not listen to the Word of God and they care not about the things of God. And they certainly reject the gospel of grace. And again, that's a perfect description of those who are outside of Christ. They reject Christ. There were, for many years of my life, I rejected the saving grace of Christ and the gospel of grace and therefore was totally lost. And then he continues, he says, but obey righteous, unrighteousness again. So the negative would be that they do not obey the gospel. Well, here's the positive thing that Paul writes. And it's really not, I'm not saying grammatically positive, but not theologically positive. He says they obey unrighteousness. They live in sin. They, they swim in the, in the pool of transgression. They, they soak in the sewer of iniquity. Because of their love for sin, they are damned eternally and lost and cut off from the life of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God. Things which they experienced in one sense or another in this earthly life. For God has shown those things to all men in varying degrees, yes, but in a common way. And then listen to what it says at the end of verse 8. Wrath and in indignation. That would be God's punishment. God's punishment comes upon the wicked. God does not punish the righteous. God does not condemn the righteous. And that is why, friends, you need to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Your hope must be in the finished work of Christ. Otherwise, God will see you in your sin when you stand before Him on the day of judgment and you will be rejected by God. The Lord Jesus Christ, the judge, will say to the wicked, Depart from me, for I never knew you, you who practice lawlessness, as it is recorded in Matthew chapter 7. And so that is ultimately what the wicked shall receive, what the sinners shall receive, what we all deserve to receive from God. In fact, we do not want what we deserve. We really don't want God in the sense of His perfect justice to be fair. Because in that, in God's perfect justice toward us, we will be eternally lost forever. But what the glorious truth of the Gospel is, is that God is just and gracious, is holy and loving toward His people. And He provides the sacrifice for sin. It's His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, comes in and condescends and dies a sinner's death upon a cross and propitiates the holy wrath of God as the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Truly, this was out of the mind of God and the utter brilliance of who God is this is, in the full sense, a great manifestation of the glory of God.
You could say this is out of the genius of God and the brilliance that He possesses intrinsically. This gospel of grace. The gospel of God as it is oftentimes titled in the New Testament. But we ask ourselves, we ask ourselves, who is God? Who is the creator of all things? Who is the one who has made us and who sustains us and who is working all things to its appointed end? Who is the Lord of hosts? Well, God is an infinite, eternal, immutable God. He is triune, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three eternal persons, co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. All three possessing the being of God, the full essence and nature of who God is. And that nature not in any way being divided. The unity of the Trinity is a glorious truth. God also in His character, as I've mentioned a few times here, is is just. That is, that He sees to it that justice is administered. And we ourselves reflect this attribute of God. God has actually communicated this attribute to us in a very small fashion. We know right from wrong, and we desire that righteousness would be done here on earth. That when someone breaks the law, they, they receive the due penalty for their error. That they be punished for their law breaking. We desire this from God. Because God has given us an inherent knowledge of good and evil, of righteousness and unrighteousness. And we want, in some way, we want goodness to be accomplished. We want murderers and rapists to be punished. That's a manifestation of the justice of God because God has given us that inherent knowledge of His justice. So even apart from Holy Scripture, we see these things revealed to us in creation. This is what theologians call general revelation versus specific revelation, that being Scripture. Also, as Psalm 93 verse 1 says, the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. The Lord is clothed and girded Himself with strength. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Your throne is established from old and you are from everlasting. So that reveals to us the truth about God, that God is immutable, He does not change, and He is eternal, and that God reigns. Here's the thing about uh, that God you ought to know is that God is the King of the universe. He rules and He reigns, and His decree shall not be resisted. See, whenever a king gives an edict or a decree to his subjects, they must submit to it. They must obey it. And so too, when God gives a decree, we ought to obey it, we ought to listen. We ought to give heed to what He has said. And even in Psalm 94, just one psalm over, in verse 2, the psalmist even says this about God. He says, Rise up, O judge of the earth. Render recompense to the proud. So we see again, the Scriptures reference the justice of God. Another attribute that I mentioned earlier is God's holiness. That would be that God is set apart from this world and from the sin that lies therein. He is set apart from us and our faults and our filth. And He is perfect in the uttermost. To the uttermost, He is perfect in His character. Also, God is gracious and merciful. We see those attributes revealed to us every day. We see God's grace and God's mercy put on display before our eyes for us to see and to behold and ultimately to give Him the glory for and on account of. Also, as 1 John 4, 8 tells us, God is love. God personifies that which is love. Or you could say it like this, He defines love. He is the essence of what it is. But these attributes of God stand in beautiful unison with one another and there is no contradiction. There is no friction between these attributes. No, there is not. They all stand alongside one another. Each showing us another aspect of God's glory. Like different facets of a diamond. And so in God in His perfect holiness, 
and in His righteousness has put forth His law, His Ten Commandments. And perhaps if you've grown up in church, you have heard of these commandments. You've heard of the Ten Commandments. God said in, the, in those commands, you shall not lie or steal. He said you shall not disobey your parents or you should not dishonor your parents, I should say. God forbid things like you shall not commit adultery. Now He also for, forbid the Israelites worshiping another god or idolatry is, is oftentimes called in Scripture. In fact, Jesus affirmed the validity of these commandments that were given in the Old Testament in the New Testament in Mark chapter 10. Jesus in, in verse 19 speaking to the rich young ruler says, You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. And these commands show us the character of God, who God is, and what God possesses intrinsically. It shows us His holy character. It is as if it was a mirror. God's law as if you could think of it as if it is a mirror that reflects to us the perfect character of God. For the command says you shall not murder. Why? Because God does not murder. He's not a murderous God. Do not commit adultery. God is a perfect, faithful, covenant-keeping God. So forth, down the line. Do not bear false witness. Why does God forbid lying? Because God cannot lie. It is a contradiction to His character. And so these laws are perfect because God is perfect. And these laws are also there to show us something else. And that is our character in light of the character of God, in light of, the, of who God is. The law is there to bring about the knowledge of sin. That's precisely what Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 20, when he says, For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. God's law was not there as a means for our salvation. It was not there to, show, to, to be the manner, be the, be the way that we're saved, that we perform before God and earn righteousness through the law. For as Paul says elsewhere, if righteousness is through the law, then Christ died needlessly. God's law is there to show us our sin in light of the perfection of of God's character. And so when we consider those commands that God gave, you shall not steal. Well, we ask ourselves, have I ever stolen in my entire life? If so, you have that blemish upon your record. You have that filth upon you. Or ask yourself, have I ever lied? If so, then you have broken and transgressed that command and you have acted in contradiction to the character of God, in, in contradiction to who God is. <laughs> or have you perfectly obeyed and honored your parents? Well, certainly not. Therefore, by, that, by breaking that law, you've also offended the character of God. Or as I made mention of earlier, the, the forbidding of idolatry, that is worshipping anything else before the Lord, or worshipping a false god, worshipping any other god but Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of Israel. If so, then you've also broken that command and you have that guilt upon you. And this isn't just for certain types of people, this is all people. There's an equal plane before the holy law of God that we find ourselves standing upon with mankind to our left and mankind to our right surrounded by our fellow men. We are not, no one is better than anyone else and no one is worse than anyone else. We're all in this equal plane of, of condemnation and hopelessness before God because of sin. But the condition is worse than that. It is not just that we have committed sin, but we love sin. Paul told the Ephesians in Ephesians 2.1, he said, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Well, a sinner is not just someone who has made a few mistakes, but is someone who is in, is in rebellion to God and who hates God and who is dead in sin. I was dead in sin for many years until God, by the regenerating work of the Holy Spirit, raised me to spiritual life. And friends, I have the greatest confidence in God's saving power to tell you that if you call upon the name of the Lord, you will be saved as Acts 2.20 tells us. 
that no one will be rejected who comes unto the Lord Jesus Christ for saving grace, for mercy from God. No one will be turned away from the feast of eternal life. The food has been prepared. The placemats have been put there. The silverware is ready. Feast upon the grace of God, dear friends. But nonetheless, as I was saying, so it, we find ourselves in this deadness to sin, in this rebellion to the law of God, and, to, and, and a lack of conformity unto His law. And so, because of our sin, just as a murderer or a rapist here in Greenville must be thrown into prison, perhaps even worse, for their law-breaking, when we break the law of God, we, when we fail to act in conformity to His commands, we bring upon ourselves the just penalty that our sins deserve. And God's penalty for sin is, is really in, is two separate things, really. And it's one thing, but it has two aspects. One, there's the, there's the positive aspect, which is that we deserve to go to hell, which is where we are condemned unto outside of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. All of us are condemned to the place that Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said it is a place of outer darkness. He said it is a place that has an unquenchable fire. It is not a place, friends, that you in your right mind do, do want to go. No man in his right mind wants to go there. So that's the positive aspect. Then the negative aspect of that would be is that we're shut off from the presence of God. When, when someone is, is cast into hell for their sin, they are shut out and, and cut off from the grace and the kindness and the mercy of God. Things that they experienced in one way or another in their earthly life, they're cut off from those things. They're separated from the life of God. And all they are receiving upon themselves in hell is the judgment of God, is the wrath of God upon the wicked. That's why as I just read earlier in Romans chapter 1, verse 18, when it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And so here we are, friends. This is our state. This is the state of the lost before God. Truly what the text reads in Romans chapter 2, verse 8 shall come true about us if we are not saved from this plight. That we who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation shall await us on that day that we die or the Lord Jesus returns and judges the wicked. If I could describe the state of sinners outside of Christ in their sin would be, in one word, hopelessness, because even religious performance cannot amend a man or a woman to God. It cannot repair the relationship of enmity. And at, it, them being at war with God, it still will not soften that and still will not remove the wrath of God. And so... It is truly a situation of hopelessness. However, as Scripture says, and I will steal from the Apostle Paul in Romans, excuse me, in his language he uses in Ephesians chapter 2 when he says, but God being rich in mercy. God has a particular love for His people. He has a great love for His elect, his, the bride of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ. And so God, out of a great love for His people, out of a great love for sinners, Jesus Christ saves sinners. And so the Father in His great love for the people of God sent His Son, Jesus Christ. Christ came in the grace of God and came to redeem a sinful people from their sins. In fact, Matthew 1 tells us that His name shall be called Jesus, for He will save His people from their sins. The name Jesus in Hebrew is Yeshua, which means Yahweh saves. Even His name testifies to what He came to do. He came to save His people from eternal damnation. and from being lost forever.
He came to this earth and lived a humbled life as a carpenter in Israel. God Almighty dwelling among men, the second person of the Trinity, the Son, the eternal Son of God, came down and dwelt among sinners <coughs> and fully fulfilled the law that we broke. So God's law that we, we, we rebelled against and we broke and we trampled it underfoot, those commands, Christ lived in, in total submission and in full obedience to those commands. He, he completely kept the law of God on our behalf. So when we see those commands that say, you shall not lie, or you shall not steal, Christ kept those commands fully. And in no way did He rebel against them. In fact, as it says in, in the book of Mark, it says in Mark chapter 1, that there at the baptism of Jesus, there was a voice out of the heavens. Let me get my speaker out. I can't. That's just spe this is the speaker. That's the headset. Let me get my uh, speaker. Hear me? Yeah. There we go. What was wrong? I don't know. Could be the battery. Yeah, right, thank right. you. Why would I do just go over here and say something? At the baptism of Jesus Christ, the Father declares from heaven. In verse 11 of Mark chapter 1, it says, You are my beloved Son, in 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 you I am well pleased. So the Father from heaven declares, just turn it off. Just I'll just preach a cappella or <laughs> without speaker. Thank you so much. <clears throat> All right. <sighs> so the Father declares from heaven, You are my beloved Son. In you I am well pleased. The Father was pleased in the performance of His Son, was pleased in the life of His Son that He lived on behalf of the people of God. And so Christ fulfilled the law that we broke. And then as Scripture says, He humbled Himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death on the cross. He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God and was beat, was whipped and spat upon and nailed to a Roman cross there in Israel some 2,000 years ago. And as He was hanging upon the cross of Calvary, as He was hanging there as the Lamb of God, the Scripture says that He cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama shabakathani, that is my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The Father unleashed upon His Son the full fury of His wrath. The Father crushed the Son whom He loved. The Father loved His Son, yet the, the Father in His love for us put the penalty that we deserve on the Lord Jesus Christ. That is the love of God commended toward us. That's the love of God displayed for His people. That's why Paul could go on in Ephesians chapter 5 and say, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself up for her. Christ, out of a love for His people, laid Himself down willingly. Isaiah 53 10 says it pleased the Lord to crush him. The father's wrath was satisfied in the death of his son. It was propitiated. It was appeased. And that is why at that hour of death, Jesus could say to Telestai that is, it is finished. The, the, the debt is paid for. The wrath that God has against the people of God has, has been paid for and it's gone. And so now God can show grace to the wicked. God can now be, as Paul said in Romans 3, just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That's the glory of the Gospel, friends. That God can still be holy and just and yet gracious and compassionate at the same time. And He provided that that glorious 
mixture, that glorious unison between His attributes in the cross of His Son. Because the cross of Jesus Christ is a demonstration of the holiness of God and of the grace of God. Of both the wrath of God and the love of God. That God does not sweep sin under the rug and He does not forget sin and He does not simply arbitrarily forget about it or forgive it. But it must be punished. It must be put away. There must be justice rendered. And so Christ satisfies the wrath of the Father. And that's why in Mark chapter 15, verse 38, it says, And the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to to bottom and that veil that is found there in the temple in Jesus' day was a veil that separated the most holy place from the holy place in the temple there in Israel and it separated the people from the presence of God it was symbolic that they could not walk into God's presence that only one man once a year on Yom Kippur the high priest could step in behind the veil and stand before God and offer up a sacrifice on behalf of the people of God. And all that ultimately pointed to the coming work of Jesus Christ. That Jesus, when He died, that veil in the temple was ripped from top to bottom, showing that the, the bridge had been gapped between God and man. That God had made the way of salvation through the death of His Son and through the sacrifice of His Son had provided eternal salvation for the people of God. And as we know from the historical record that is given in the New Testament, after three days in the tomb, Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. The Father rose Him up on that third day as the public display, as the public declaration that He had received His atoning sacrifice as the propitiation for our sin. That it was enough that the Father was pleased. You could say that the, the resurrection of Christ was the Father's amen to Jesus as it is finished. It was the Father approving of the sacrifice of His Son. Do you realize the significance of this? Do you realize the glory of this, friends? The, the uniqueness of the person and work of Jesus Christ. There's nothing else like this found in the world. There is nothing else like this found anywhere else. This comes forth out of the wisdom and power and the brilliance of God. <clears throat> and friends, this is because God so loved sinners. The Gospel is Jesus saves sinners. In fact, listen to what Paul writes in, Re in Galatians chapter 3. He says in verse 10, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, as it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Friends, Christ has redeemed His church from the curse of the law, having Himself become a curse on their behalf. 2 Corinthians 5.21 puts it like this, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin for us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. That succinctly captures the message of the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, actually, I'm pretty good. Thank you. I'm liking this for a moment. There is none good. I know what. What's that? There are none good. I know what. Second Corinthians. Thank you. Thank you. Prisoner. Second Corinthians five twenty-seven. To five twenty-one. There, uh, verse twenty-seven. I don't think that it exists. Uh, it, it ends at verse twenty-five. Yeah, or, or, yeah, twenty-one. You're right. You're right. <coughs> 
And so friends, after 40 days of further ministry among his disciples, he then was exalted into celestial glory. He was received into heaven and he is set down at the right hand of majesty on high and he has completed the work of eternal salvation on behalf of his people once for all the high priest has sat down in the temple in israel there were no seats for the priests they had to stand their entire time that they were in the temple as a symbol that their work was continual day after day year after year however christ the high priest forever according to the order of melchizedek came in and sat down after completing the work of salvation on behalf of the people of God. And so he reigns and he rules as the king of the, of the world, as of glory. The king of glory reigns, my friends, on this throne in glory. And my friends, the, the proper heart reaction to this glorious gospel message, the proper posture that the soul of man is to take in light of the finished work of Christ is one of repentance and faith in His finished work. Friends, you must repent. Firstly, that means to change your mind about your sin and to flee your rebellion, to flee your pornography. Friends, God sees your internet browsing history. When you press the delete button, God keeps a record. Friends, God sees what is done in secret. He sees the thoughts of the heart. He sees the intents of the heart. And as, as Genesis 6, 5 tells us, it is always to do evil continually. Friends, you must repent. Repent or perish. Jesus said in Luke 13, 3, I tell you, unless you repent, you will all likewise perish in your sins. And secondly, you must believe the gospel. You must be like Abraham and take a humble posture of faith in the promises of God. You must believe the promises of God as they are revealed in His Son. You must believe that what God said concerning Jesus Christ in the written Word of God is sufficient and it is true. That Jesus Christ truly came to die for your sin and was raised on your behalf. You must grab hold of that glorious gospel of grace and believe it. Friends, believe it as if your whole life depends upon it. Because not only does your life depend on it, but your eternal salvation. Friends, this is your soul. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Don't die in your sins. But look to Christ. Look to Christ for eternal life, friends. Time is of the essence. Time is running out, friends. Flee, flee to the Savior. The flood of God's wrath will drown the wicked. But the ark of salvation has been prepared in the sight of all people, and that is Christ Jesus the Lord. That is the proper reaction to the gospel. It is one of repentance and faith in the finished work of Christ. It is by grace that we are saved through faith and that not of ourselves it is the gift of God not as a result of works so that no one may boast salvation is a free gift of the grace of God out of the bounty of God's loving kindness and mercy towards sinners so friends receive this glorious gift of eternal life this day the sinner who repents and who looks to Christ will be forgiven of all their sins, past, present, and future. Those who believe the gospel will be forgiven of all sin, and they will be wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They will be credited with having lived Jesus' life. God will credit to their account. He will impute to them the righteousness of His dear Son. So that when God looks upon the sinner, He sees Christ, because when He looked on Christ, He saw the sinner. When he looked upon his son at that cross, he saw the sin of Christ's people. Friends, that's the exchange of the gospel. That's the great exchange. Christ takes my sin. Christ takes my filth. And I get his perfect righteousness. I'm wrapped in it as my garment. My own, my very own. For me to have before God. And to, in the eyes of God, be perfect because of the performance of Jesus Christ. Friends, please, please come to Christ and live this day. 
Look to the Savior. This is all, this economy of salvation is so ordered to bring God all of the glory and all of the honor and all the praise. Salvation is 100% of God and 0% of man so that God gets 100% of the glory. Not an ounce of it is by human will or exertion, but it is by the sovereign grace and the free grace of God as it is bestowed and dispersed upon wicked sinners. And friends, as I said, this is for the glory of God. So the sinner ought to come to the Savior for the glory of God. As the hymn says, Oh, come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory, the great things that He has done. Truly the things which the Lord Jesus Christ has done are great. They are great indeed. And so, He is worthy to be ascribed glory. He is worthy of worship and praise. And He is worthy of adoration and adulation. Friends, whatever your heart most clings to, that is your God. Friends, if you want to know whether Christ is your God and your King, does your heart cling for Him? Do you grab hold of Him and not let Him go out of desperation? He is so, so glorious. It is all for His glory. Christ did what He did to bring praise to His name, to bring glory to His name. And so I say to Him be the glory, to Him be the honor, to Him be the worship and the adoration of all people. To Him be the glory in all things forever and ever. Friends, Please flee the wrath which is to come. Flee the wrath of God. And look to Christ. Look to Jesus Christ for eternal life. There is no other Savior. There is no other way of eternal life. Christ is the way and the truth and the life. And no man comes unto the Father but through Him. If you want access to God, it is only obtained through the finished work of Jesus Christ. Through the shed blood of the Savior who was slain at Calvary. And even you who are religious, you who think yourselves to be righteous, you are in great need of a Savior. You are in a, a, a very terrifying situation because you need salvation, yet you think yourselves not to need salvation. Oh, even you, you must humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and look to Christ for eternal life. Believe upon the Savior. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved from your sin. And you Christians here this day, this evening, I encourage you to feed upon this gospel of grace. It is our daily bread. To feed upon the gospel of salvation because it is the power of God. Friends, I encourage you, my dear brethren, to preach the gospel unto the lost, to, to publish this gospel wherever you may go and wherever God in His sovereignty takes you in this life. We are commanded to preach Christ to a lost and dying world. So fellow Christians, I exhort you with the uttermost sincerity to preach Christ and Him crucified till the day you die. So in closing, we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, that God judges people and deals with people according to what their deeds deserve. Those who are good, God rewards them with eternal life. But those who are wicked, God rewards them with eternal damnation. And no one is good as the text of Scripture clearly testifies. No one is good. No one can be good enough to make it to heaven. No one is good enough to stand before God. No man can approach God's holy presence. And so because of our sin, we are lost and without hope. But God sent His Son to come and to die as a sacrifice for sin and to be raised on the third day. And whoever looks to Him will have eternal life. They will have life eternally. They'll be freed from their sin. Freed from both the power and the effect of sin in their lives. Jesus Christ saves sinners and He does it for His glory and His praise and His honor and for the glory of His Father, God the Father. I will close with the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 11, verse 36, 
which simply reads, for, and he's speaking of God here. He says, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen.